My presentation here this morning is going to be quite different from when I present as a professional and that alone. It's, it's quite an interesting question, who am I, who am I speaking as, how did I get here sort of stuff. And when I was first asked to, to present today as a victim's voice, I was actually quite indignant about it. I didn't like that idea at all. And I asked myself, why did I get so upset? Was it because that meant my peers didn't see me as a professional? Did it mean that they'd only seen me as a victim? And I must note, Mandy used the word survivor, so thank you. Um, but was it because I couldn't possibly adequately begin to represent the diverse and divergent faces and voices of people affected <coughs> by violence? Or was it because it forced me to own my own victimisation and hold it in my hand as I stood in front of you? Was it that I didn't really like violent, victim of violence or survivor, that I was a person who had been harmed and whose life continues to be impacted on by crime? And being a postmodern thinker as I am, I didn't really work out which one of that it was and I decided it didn't have to be either or, or it could be all of the above or a little bit of each. It didn't really matter. The point was that I worked through that process and I thought this is a very important opportunity to share with a group of people. And then I thought I'm probably preaching to the converted. <laughs> Which, again, I thought, what, what is left for me to, to talk about? What, is, what can I tell these people that they might not already think about? And I thought, well, all I can talk about is my journey as a person, as a practitioner and as a researcher. So I'm not going to try and make too much of a divide of when I'm speaking of each because so far although my body has been divided up into some parts it's not going to be divided up neatly into thirds. So here we go. I'm going to tell you a story about a girl, a simple girl, who grew up in a simple world and whose life became something so different and unrecognisable that she never ever imagined it would be. I'm going to share with you some of the events and feelings that, that she and observations and activities that she's engaged within. And what I share, and I use the word about me and my, but I've chosen these words very carefully in the, the things that I share because for me they hold the echoes of other people's realities. And I use the word reality very carefully because I'm not a story. This isn't a story, this is real, this is what happened in my world. And I think when you've been affected by a crime and it becomes a newspaper story, and excuse me, <coughs> I, I come with this little warning that it could be dangerous to open the package, it could be unpleasant to listen to some of the things I've got to say, and it could have some swear words. So, <laughs> if you can deal with that, the newspapers often print a load of shit, basically. <laughs> So I didn't want to be a story. I wanted people to realise this was real and it happened to real people across the world. It's not murdertainment, it's not special crime victims unit, it's real stuff. So I'd also like to say that every example I share is not to be critical or disrespectful to those professionals who struggle to do the best they can with often inadequate resources and not enough training because as we heard it's only a new discipline that we're learning to understand. So where did this girl's journey begin? Well she, she was born into a, a family where she thought she was pretty lucky but on reflection she would have been labelled an at-risk kid. She came from the wrong side of the railway tracks and she was from, as a teacher once said, an SL, um, LSE. And I, I sort of scratched my head as a professional and went, what's that? It's low socioeconomic background. I thought, wow, wasn't I lucky? I had another three-letter acronym. Woo! So, but I was probably one of the lucky ones because I looked socially acceptable. I was a cute kid, you know. I wasn't too unpleasant on the <coughs> eye. And when I was a little kid, that was great. I did reasonably well at primary school. And, however, when I got to high school, being good-looking wasn't that great. You know, I learnt the downside to getting all this male attention that you didn't really want. And I won't say too much more about that, I'll, I'll let you read between the lines. But I discovered boys and I got very distracted. You know, they were fun. Still are. 
are some of them and uh, anyway here I was 15 and my mother said to me and God love her she was doing the best she could she said Anne your sister's got the brains you've got the looks you should get married quickly before they fade <laughs> now I was 15 my sister was very good at maths and sciences and all those things and uh, so I, for the very first time in my life, because I'd been told repeatedly I was mouthy and I said too much and I didn't adhere to enough rules, for the first time I thought, gee, that means I better do what I'm told for a change. And I had this gentleman, who appeared to be a gentleman anyway, um, who wanted to, to court me. So I began courting him when I was 14 and a half and by the time I was 17 I was one of the, the lucky 3% the pill didn't work for. Only time the odds went in my favour and it was a bonus package and it came with lots of good stuff. But it wasn't quite where I wanted to be. I was mortified. You know, I was 17, unmarried and pregnant. Not where I wanted to be because I'd run away from home at the age of 14 and decided my life was going to be drastically different from that of those that I'd grown up with. I was going to have a real job and own my own house. They were my aspirations. So I had... Package number one, Kyle came into the world, albeit very challenging. I also, two years later, decided that being such a, a um, vocal and hyperactive package, I um, would have another one quickly because, you know, if I didn't, I might not ever go back to what I call crappy nappies and sleepless nights. So our daughter Letitia arrived in the world and my marriage was something that I could say was, thank you, um, pleasant in one aspect, but it wasn't quite what you would call fulfilling or didn't really make me feel very alive. Most people when they get pregnant and have babies get fatter. I was 55 kilos before I started and by the time number two had, was about six weeks old I was lucky if I weighed 40 kilos. I was told I was anorexic, I was working but with both children quite quickly so the world just kept telling me that you know I was wrong for being so skinny I should eat more and you know it was like very interesting. I got blamed for everything that went wrong in my marriage and when I finally asked my husband to leave it took me four months to get him to leave. I've left out a lot within that for, for many reasons but once I finally got him out it was only on the basis he left suicide notes. At that point everybody told me I needed a psychologist, there was something wrong with me. How could I possibly not want to be married to a man who didn't beat me every day and who didn't have affairs, didn't drink and didn't take drugs? What was wrong with me? You know, your expectations are too high, love. I just wanted somebody who respected me and listened to me. And not having had a lot of education by that stage, because I left school at the end of um, year 10, I really couldn't put my finger on it. But in the months that followed, um, by this stage, some, some 14 months have, you know, of harassment, of stalking, of breaking my property, of unwanted gifts, of, of just totally unpredictable behaviour of calling the police and being told don't worry love it's normal he'll get over it no problems just just ride it out and be fine my friends and family were were telling me that I needed to to keep you know it together and look after the kids you know he'll, he'll get through it and you really should take him back because all this tells you he really loves you and for me that wasn't quite what I was hearing and uh, it culminated in um, 1994 when he broke into my home, took the children's lives, attempted to take mine and committed suicide, all, all in the one room in front of me. I called the police and a very different life began. And being in hospital for two and a half months, the nurses did the best they could, the doctors, well, I don't really remember them. <laughs> Sounds odd, doesn't it? But I don't. Um, and everything, you know, it was, was as good as it could be under the circumstances. However, the media printed, you know, a whole lot of crap. They didn't investigate one single thing. Everything had been done by consent. I'd been the, the best ex-wife you could possibly be because I didn't want to be one of those bitch ones you read about in the newspaper. But suddenly the newspaper had made me one anyway. So rather than dwelling on, on um, you know, the horror of what had happened, my family were so happy that I was alive, I became this beacon of hope for them. 
people said things to me, stupid things. They didn't mean to say them stupidly, but they did. Oh, you're so lucky. You're young, aren't you? 24. You can have some more children. <laughs> How wonderful. You know, I'm thinking, yeah, great. I've got 50 years to live with this crap. Fantastic. I'm very excited. But I learnt they didn't know what else to say. So I had to teach them and I had to learn how together we could negotiate this landscape. I had to learn how to tell the psych department because I wasn't qualified for a medical bed anymore. I had to go into a psych ward, you know, and once I got down there, well, I was certainly very underweight by now because I weighed about 30 kilos after two and a half months in hospital. So I was definitely going to be anorexic. So they wouldn't let me out. <laughs> So I had to teach them that actually this wasn't the case, this was all about stress. I had police who were fantastic in the initial times, but they didn't investigate properly. The fact that there'd been two men outside my house earlier with petrol cans pouring something off my lawn, I still to this day don't know what they were doing. There was money missing. Did he pay somebody? Had he tried to kill me earlier? Who knows? I will never know those answers. And it seemed to people it didn't matter because it was an open and shut case. Centrelink, great. Do you know that when you have a missing leg, it might grow back? So, you have to be on sickness benefit for 12 months. And you have to go to the doctor and you have to get a doctor certificate to say your leg's still missing. It's not, not come back yet. And I love the euphemism, I lost it. I don't quite know where it is yet. I actually took in a wanted poster. Because I had a manual car. I couldn't drive with one leg in a manual car. It didn't work. I had to pay for a doctor's appointment every 12 weeks to say my leg was still missing. This stupidity of a system was outrageous to me. And I thought, well, it's just because you're extreme, Anne. You know, you're one of those that doesn't quite fit the box. They're not used to this. So the social worker then told me that <laughs> my children were responsible for their own bank accounts. Now, I made a joke yesterday that social workers are social workers and not psychologists because they're not good at maths. I'm a social worker, by the way, so I can say that with all the greatest of respect. But she couldn't work out that at 24 it was almost impossible for me to have a 16-year-old child, let alone two of them. So I had to slap her around the head with the reality. If only she read what was on the form in front of her, she would see why my children weren't responsible for their bank accounts themselves. And I had to tell her four times to read the piece of paper that I'd arduously and heartbreakingly filled in before she said, well, why should I read it? And I screamed at her, because they're dead. And I never swore before this either, which was interesting. So, again, just the simplest thing of reading a form would have saved me so much pain. And these are the things that I hear people say over and over again. Not knowing if there was going to be an inquest. Having superannuation policies that deemed the fact I was a nice ex-wife, you know, not wanting to be the bitch one, it actually worked against me because the children died approximately 60 seconds before he did and I didn't take him for spousal maintenance, only child maintenance. At the time of the children's deaths, I was not financially dependent upon him. So therefore, I was not entitled to his superannuation. It wasn't very much, folks, but hey, at that point with three funerals to pay for and all, you know, a prospect of not working, every bit of money was going to help. So it took me three years and $5,000 in legal fees to actually access his superannuation, despite being the named beneficiary, the legal next of kin and the sole beneficiary of his estate. It then took me another two years to get a special tax exemption because he died intestate without a will. So they were going to tax me 50 cents in the dollar. So having thought that the world would be kind and benevolent to me afterwards, I realised that it's not. People live in a world where they don't expect other people to do bad things. We don't set up our systems and our processes in a way that is prepared and, and reflective <coughs> and responsive to those individual cases where there's extreme violence or a homicide, let alone a few of them in one go.